If you don't mind standing for a moment, I want to read um, our opening text, our opening passage of Scripture. And um, I have a little bit of context that I need to share with us before I get into it. So there's a nation called Israel, and Israel, led by their king Ahab, has led uh, the nation of Israel astray. They've been worshiping other gods. And so God has declared that there's a drought in the land. And so for three years, it does not rain. God then, after three years, instructs Elijah to go tell King Ahab the rain is coming. That's the context that we're picking it up. Does that make sense? First King 18, First Kings chapter 18, verse 41. Elijah said to Ahab, Go eat and drink, for there is the sound of a heavy rain. So Ahab went off to eat and to drink, but Elijah climbed, down to the, climbed up to the top of Mount Carmel. He bent down to the ground and put his face between his knees. He then said to his servant, go and look toward the sea. His servant went up and looked, and he said, there's nothing there. Seven times, Elijah said, go back. The seventh time, the servant reported a cloud as small as a man's hand, is rising from the sea. So Elijah said, go and tell Ahab, hitch up your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. I want to speak this morning um, on the subject of how to hear the rain. How to hear the rain. Come on, can we put our hands together? You guys can find a seat in this place this morning. Thank you so much, worship team. Come on, can we give it up for the worship team? So glad that you guys could be with us. 11 a.m. Hey, I jest, but I love you all. So glad you guys could be here. My name is Harrison. If we have not yet met, and I have the privilege of leading this church alongside my beautiful wife, Christy. And if we have not yet met, come on. Say hello uh, after service. We'd love to meet you. Um, so glad you could be here. We are in the sixth week of a series that we are calling Summer Mix Tape. So can you make some noise if you've heard any part to the mixtape? So good. And so what this has been, every single week is a brand new message. Uh, we've had different artists on the mixtape. Uh, you got me today, but next week, uh, super excited for the very first time, uh, officially as a pastor in the church, we got Pastor Amy sharing next week, which is going to be great. That's track seven of the mixtape. Uh, today is track six. And so uh, before I get into it, before I speak on the subject of how to hear the rain, uh, I want to tell you guys a story. And uh, as I tell this story, for anyone that works in retail, um, I apologize for people like me. Uh, on behalf of people like me. Um, so, I got a gift uh, a few weeks back. I got a brand new t-shirt. Uh, it was a Nike t-shirt. If you want to know how to get to my heart, just buy me Nike products. And so, uh, I got this brand new Nike t-shirt. I looked at it. I was like, oh, sweet, this looks cool. And so, I threw the receipt away, never to think about it again. Last Sunday, I wanted to wear this particular shirt to church. I tried it on, and it was too big. I looked like I was swimming in this thing. It was a large, sometimes I wear a large, sometimes not. And so um, I decided, because it was too big, I needed to go and exchange it for a smaller size. Um, the only issue was I had thrown the receipt away. But, come on somebody, someone say but. But I had decided in advance what I was going to do. I was going to go to the Nike store and I was going to exchange that large shirt for a medium, and nothing was going to stop me. Because I had the tag on still, I just didn't have the receipt. So I went to the Nike store this last week, um, and I explained the whole situation. I said, hey, I got, this, um, I got this shirt as a gift, and I would just, I would love if uh, I could exchange it, because I'm, I'm, this is a large, I need a medium, but I don't have the receipt. And so they said, sorry, uh, our policy is that you need the receipt if you want to exchange the shirt. And I said, no, I get it. I understand. I'm not asking for a new shirt. I'm not asking for something different. I, I literally just want to exchange the large for a medium. Can I do that? She's like, it's not our store policy to do so. I said, I know the store policy. I said, but can you do it? 
And she said, let me get you my manager. So I said, okay. So the manager came, and uh, I explained the whole situation again. I said, hey, I got this T-shirt. It's a large. I need a medium. You see, I got the tag. I've never worn it. I need to exchange it. And the manager said to me, sorry, store policy is that we don't exchange without the receipt. And I said, you need to understand something. I don't have the receipt. Now, I did not tell them I threw the receipt away. I just said, I don't have it. It's somewhere. It's gone. It will not be found. So I get the store policy, but I just need to exchange this. And she said, let me get you my senior manager. And I said, how many lines of command does this store have? This is like the military. (laughs) And so... She gets me the senior manager. Now, you need to understand, at this point, I don't care what the senior manager is saying. I would plead my case to Phil Knight if I got my chance. I wasn't leaving that place without the new T-shirt. So I explained the situation. I said, hey, I need to exchange this large for a medium. You want to know what she said? She said, okay. I said, that's it. She said, yeah, go to the cash register. I'll get you. You want a medium? I'll get you the medium. And at the cash register, they exchanged it. She didn't even really do anything special. She literally just exchanged it, and it wasn't a big deal. And I'm here to let you guys know I'm wearing the T-shirt right now. Because I went into that place, and I was not taking no for an answer. I said, I'm preaching on Sunday, and I plan on wearing that T-shirt. But I went home, um, and I talked to, to my wife, Christy, and I was like, man, I was like, can you, like, I was like, you wouldn't believe how easy it was for them to exchange it. I was like, can you imagine if I would have given up after the first person said no? I was like, can you imagine if I would have given up after the second person said no? Because I know they can do it. And I was thinking about that this week, and I began to wonder how many of us in our lives, when it feels like we hear no, when we feel like a door shuts, I wonder how many of us give up on the very first sign of trouble. I wonder how many of us in this room, God has called us to places, God has called us to spaces, to people, but the moment we feel like life is throwing a no in our face, we give up. So I just felt like today I had to wear this shirt as a prophetic declaration for someone that has been given up at the sign of trouble to let you know in the name of Jesus, come on somebody, Don't give up. It's too early to say no. It's too early to quit. It's too early to stop running the race. Don't give up. And so here's what I want to speak on today. Because some of us in this place, we feel like, Harrison, you don't know my life situation. You don't know my circumstance. If you saw what I saw around me, if you knew what I was going through, you would want to give up too. And so today what I want to speak on, here's my big thought. I want to speak on this subject of how can I continue to move forward in faith in the midst of hard seasons? How can I move forward in faith? How can I go to the dreams, to the places, to the spaces that I'm supposed to go to when my life doesn't look like anything is happening? Really what I want to talk about today is how can I hear the sound of rain in the midst of dry seasons? How can I hear the rain in the midst of a drought. And so that's what I want to do today. Can I do that? So I want to get into the book of First Ki- the, the, the book of First Kings, specifically chapter 18. But before I start reading, I need to give us some context because there's a lot going on. I gave us some context at the start. I want to give us a little more context. So if you're new to church, the book of First Kings is in the Old Testament. The Old Testament, if you read it, the central focus of the Old Testament is on this nation called Israel. Can you guys say Israel? Now, Israel still exists today. In the Old Testament, they're the primary focus, and Israel is special because they are God's people. They are God's people that he has chosen for a purpose. He has chosen to reveal himself to and through, but we see this tension in the Old Testament. Israel is God's people. He's pursuing them. He's chasing after them, but Israel oftentimes seems to be going in the opposite direction of where God is calling them to go. Can anyone relate to that in their life in this place? Sometimes I feel like God's calling me places, but I'm going in the opposite direction. What happens specifically in the book of Kings is that 
Israel has asked, they said, hey, we want a king. We want a real person to lead us. God, you're good, you're cool, but we want a king to lead us. God's like, okay, if you want a king, it's not going to go well for you, but here you go. And I think that there's something within us as people, and it's not necessarily a bad thing, but most of us in this place, if we're honest, we crave leadership. We want someone to lead. We want someone that we, we can follow, and there's nothing wrong with leadership. But here's a leadership principle. If I'm going to follow someone, I better make sure the person I'm following is leading me in a proper and right direction. A lot of us in this place, the reason we get lost is because we're following the wrong people. Some of us in this place, the reason that people in our lives are not going in the direction they should be going is because we fail to see ourselves as a leader. And we don't realize the impact that we have on the people around us. So leadership's important. You guys understand that? So Israel has a king named Ahab. And Ahab... He's a bad dude. Israel has a whole bunch of bad kings. Ahab may be the worst of them all. And so the people of Israel are supposed to worship God. Now, in, in the Old Testament, God has a name, just so you guys know this. His name isn't just God. That's generic. His name is Yahweh or Jehovah. And so the people of Israel are supposed to follow Yahweh. Ahab comes, and he's like, hey, y'all. We're going to follow Yahweh, but we're also going to follow some other gods as well. And so Ahab leads the nation of Israel into apostasy, meaning away from God, and they begin to worship this god named Baal. Can you guys all say Baal? Come on, don't bail out on me. Can you guys say Baal? There we go. Just want to make sure you're awake because a lot of context going on here. Now, Baal, in, in, in Canaanite mythology, Baal was uh, the god of fertility and the god of the rain, right? He was the thunder god. And so what's really interesting in this story, because I told us off the top, God has pronounced judgment on Israel because they have failed to follow him. And the judgment that God pronounces on Israel, he says, hey, it's not going to rain. Now what's interesting, because I think God has a sense of humor, is that he is not even so much pronouncing judgment on the people of Israel. He's more so pronouncing judgment on the gods that they serve. And what he's saying, he's saying, hey, listen, you want to follow the rain god? I'll show you who controls the flow. And so God says, on my word, it will not rain unless I said so. Because understand this, sometimes God has to cut off the things in your life that you think controls the flow so you know who controls the flow. And that's what we see in the book of 1 Kings chapter 18. That's a whole sermon right there I could get into, but I don't, I don't got time for that today. So what happens is God cuts the rain. It does not rain for three years. That's the context where we pick it up. You guys ready? I say, you guys ready? Come on, don't laugh, Allie. Respond instead. 1 Kings 18, verse 1. <laughs> She's like, yeah, no one's responding. Respond. Anyways, I love you all. Uh, Kyle, in the back, can you press the fan button? I'm hot. I don't know if you guys are hot, but um, it's that right there. You're, you're by it. Perfect. First Kings 18, verse 1. It says, after a long time, in the third year, the word of the Lord came to Elijah. He said, go and present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the land. So Elijah went to present himself to Ahab. So God sends the word. He said, <laughs> it's, just, it's just the button on, on the left. <laughs> Like on the left, the one by itself, press it. Perfect. You got it. <laughs> I'm just watching them struggle like, when I know the answer. Um, so here's what's happening. Third year, God says to Elijah, go present yourself to Ahab. Tell him it's about to rain. Now here's what you need to understand. Ahab doesn't like Elijah. In fact, Ahab hates Elijah. And so this word that God is giving to Elijah has two kind of parts to it that make this sort of a faith moment. Number one, Elijah has to believe that if he goes and presents himself to Ahab, Ahab just won't kill him. But number two, he has to believe that God is going to actually send the rain. It takes one thing to hear God's voice. It takes another thing to respond to it. And so what happens is, now I'm, I'm about to skip 39 verses. So go home and read 39 verses of 1 Kings chapter 18. It's a cool story. It's kind of like a Marvel movie. Elijah battles all these false prophets. It's sweet. Check it out. But verse 41, because we're focusing on the rain today. Elijah 
gets to Ahab. And he says to him, he says, go eat and drink, for there is the sound of a heavy rain. There's a sound of a heavy rain. Now, that's an interesting line. Now, when I read that, what my brain thinks is like, okay, maybe like Elijah begins to hear the wind. Is that, is that the sound? Or maybe Elijah hears some thunder in the distance. Is that the sound? But what we're going to see in context in a moment is that when Elijah gives this message to Ahab, the weather has not changed. In fact, there is no indication that it is anything other than sunny, dry, and hot. But Elijah says, in faith, I hear the sound of an abundance of rain. So what does that mean? Well, it means one thing. What Elijah is hearing when he hears the sound of rain is not the circumstance that is around him. It is not the physical temperature. It is not the weather that he is hearing. What Elijah is doing in this moment is Elijah is choosing to hear the word of the Lord. And the word of the Lord said there's an abundance of rain coming. Because here's the truth. It's easy to believe something when I see it. It's a whole lot harder to believe something when there's no evidence of it. And so we're talking today, how do I see the rain? How do I hear the rain in the midst of dry seasons? Here's what we're really asking. How do I believe God is still good when my kids are crazy? How do I believe God is still for me when I lost my job? How do I believe that God is still real when I've experienced tragedy in my life? How do I have faith in hard seasons? And here's what I know to be true. It's a whole lot easier to have faith when you see tangible fruits of it. It's a whole lot harder to say, I hear the sound of rain, when the only sound that you have is the voice of God. So here's my first point. How do I have faith in hard seasons? Number one is this. In line with our summer mixtape, I need to choose my soundtrack. I need to choose my soundtrack. What does that mean? It means in dry and hard seasons, I need to choose the voice that I am going to let into my life. I need to choose what I am going to let be the predominant thoughts that run through my mind. Now, here is the truth. We have two choices when it comes to the soundtracks that we will listen to. Choice number one is this. I can listen to my circumstances. And let me tell you, listening to your circumstances is the easy option. Because with my circumstances, they always provide and come with feelings. And so in hard seasons, you want to know what it's going to come with? Hard feelings. And that's really easy in dry seasons to begin to have dry thoughts. My life isn't going to get better. I'm going to be like this forever. I don't think things are going to change. And my circumstances provide feelings. They become the soundtrack for what I hear and how I live my life. The second option, and this is the one that I want us to get to today, is I want us to begin to hear the Word of God and allow the Word of God to be the soundtrack that runs through my mind. Now, here's what's hard, especially in the cultural moment that we find ourselves in. I think we are in a current cultural moment that tells us our feelings are final. In other words, I feel, therefore I am. And so what happens is this. If I have some type of loss, I'm going to feel lost, or I'm going to feel broken. When I experience pain, I'm going to feel something, and feelings are fine, but I believe that feelings don't have to be final. In other words, they don't have to be the thing that begins to dictate my life. God has given you feelings, but our feelings were never meant to be in the driver's seat of our life, and the problem with feelings is that feelings always fluctuates, fluctuate. And so some of us, we have faith in good times, and we have no faith in bad times. And all that really says is I have faith when I feel something, and my faith doesn't exist when I don't. If I feel overwhelmed, I need to give up. If I feel like I'm less than, I must be less than. If I feel like my family is going to be like this forever, then my family will probably be like this forever. But I just believe today that far too many of us become slaves to our feelings when I think that God has given us the option 
and the opportunity to have a different soundtrack. I'll explain it like this. My wife does something. I love her, but she does something that kind of frustrates me, kind of annoys me if I'm being honest. Can I share with you guys? Nope. Thank you. (laughs) Allie, that was your time to shine, Allie. That was your time to shine. Can I share with you guys a story real quick? (laughs) So uh, I, I have a Spotify account. You guys know what Spotify is? listen to music on it, you know, better than Apple Music. I'm usually an Apple guy, but Spotify wins on this one. Um, I have Spotify. I pay for the account. Um, And I do not pay for the family plan because the family plan costs like $3 more a month. And I don't need the family plan because we can all listen on my plan. Now, we can't all listen at the same time, but as long as we listen at separate times, we can all listen on my Spotify account. Yes, the church uses it. Yes, I use it. Yes, she wants to use it, but I have the account. Unbeknownst to me one day, Christy went and she made her own free Spotify account. Because you can get Spotify for free. And uh, the thing about the Spotify free account is that it's kind of like the premium account. The only difference is um, you can only pick your songs a couple of times. And then once you pick your song a couple of times, it no longer allows you to change the song. And so something really frustrates me sometimes. I'll be in the house, and something crazy's happening. Or I'll have a song I want to play for Christy, and she's connected to the speaker. And I'll go to her phone, and I'll try to change the song. And it'll say, sorry, you have no more skips for today. And it'll frustrate me, because I'll say, Christy, I pay for a Spotify premium account. I paid so you don't have to be a slave to whatever they want you to listen to. Hold on, I'm preaching because I felt God say to someone today, I paid for your life. I paid for you so you don't have to be a slave to how you see yourself. I paid for you so you don't have to be a slave to what other people call you. I paid for you in full so I can have a new soundtrack. Come on, somebody. But far too many of us, we, we choose the free version. We choose the version that doesn't cost us anything. And we go through life a slave to our circumstances. But in Christ, I want you to understand something. I have a new identity. Come on. In Christ, I'm not who I was. I'm who he says I am. In Christ, I'm not a slave to what I think about myself. I'm not a slave to my familiar patterns. I'm not a slave to my past. I'm not a slave to my circumstances. I am who he says I am. I love Romans chapter 10. It says, verse 17, consequently, it says faith comes from hearing the message. And the message is heard through the word about Christ. You see, Elijah, he sees the dry land, but he hears the word of God. I hear the sound of the abundance of rain. Paul says in Romans, faith comes from hearing the message, and I hear the message through the word. So here's the truth. Many of us in this place, we cannot choose to hear a different soundtrack, specifically the soundtrack that says what God, the soundtrack of what God says about us, because we do not know what God says about us. And some of us are saying, well, Harrison, like, how do I find out what he said about me? Like, I've tried to hear, I try to hear his voice, but it's kind of murky. Can I tell you the clearest way that God has spoken about you is through his word. It's through the Bible. The clearest way that God has spoken about us is in his Bible. The clearest picture we have of him is in his word. But hear this. I cannot heed to the voice of God if I have never heard the voice of God. Even more so if I do not know the voice of God. To heed means to follow. And I cannot follow his voice if I've never heard it. And this is why, if you do not know, I am so passionate about people getting into his word. I'm passionate about people reading the Bible. I love Protestantism. We're a a Protestant church. And one of the roots of Protestantism is that we were a people that said, hey, the Bible isn't just for a few. It's for everyone. That's our heritage. That's our history. But what happens is so many of us come here on Sunday morning, and this becomes our IV where the Bible gets injected into my veins 
And I hope that it sustains me through the week. I hope that it sustains me through the hard times. I hope that it sustains me through the loss. But church and the opening of the word together is supposed to be in complement to the, to the reading I do myself. Now, some of us, like Harrison, it's kind of hard. Like, I don't, like, where do I start? Uh, can I encourage you, in the fall, join this thing that we do at church called Foundations. Now, what Foundations is, is you, if you've never heard of it, it's this thing that we've been doing for the last year here at church where we give people a solid biblical foundation. Now, some people don't join because, like, I've been in church for 20 years. I'll be embarrassed if I go there. Listen, this thing isn't just for new believers. It's for everyone. It's for everyone who wants to better understand, better be equipped for how to read the Bible. If you've been in foundations, can I encourage you? Because we're entering into Kingdom Crew season right now. What are Kingdom Crews? They are our church's version of small groups. So as we go into the fall, guess what? There's going to be a whole bunch of groups launching, a whole bunch of crews launching. Here's what you need to do if you want to get better equipped at reading the Word. I need to surround myself with people who are in the Word. Can I encourage you? Get into a group in September. Don't do this by yourself. You don't have to. But I'm passionate about people getting into the word. I'm passionate about people understanding who God is because here's what I believe. Most people don't reject God. Most people reject a picture of who they think God is. And a lot of times that picture of who they think God is comes as a result of what someone else has shown them. And that may or may not be true. I just have this belief that bad theology hurts people. Bad theology enslaves us. I think one of the reasons that some of us cannot see the rain in the midst of dry seasons is because we prescribed to a picture of God that says, if I follow Jesus, my life will be filled with health, wealth, and happiness. And if I do not have health, wealth, and happiness, God either may not be real or he must not be good. I would classify that as prosperity gospel, and I would, I would classify that as opposite of what the New Testament teaches. The New Testament does not present you a picture of when you follow Jesus, your life moves to perfection. It gives us an invitation into this beautiful work that Jesus is doing. If you don't know the biblical story, Jesus is in the process of making everything new. And the promise of Scripture is this. One day, he will make everything new. There'll be no more suffering, no more tears, no more pain. But as we go on that journey, Jesus invites us as his people into the story. And we get to build God's kingdom alongside with him. And sometimes as I build his kingdom, I experience wealth. Come on, somebody. Sometimes I experience prosperity. Sometimes I experience health. But if I don't, that doesn't change the story. Because get this, the invitation to Jesus isn't an invitation to perfection, it's an invitation to his presence. Some of us give up because we've been sold the perfection piece when Jesus just says, I want you to enter into my presence, into a relationship. I remember one of the first scriptures I ever memorized because it spoke to me and it let me know something I didn't fully understand, that if I follow Jesus, I can still have hard times. So I remember the first time I read John 16, 33. I wrote it in my Bible as my favorite verse. John 16, 33, Jesus is speaking to his disciples. And he says to them, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. He gives them a promise. He says, in this life you will have trouble. But he says, take heart, for I have overcome the world. And I clung to that. Because at times, I thought that trouble was the absence of God. But Jesus says, no, 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 no. Trouble's coming, but take heart because I've overcome it. In other words, I offer you something better and different than what is inside of me. And what's going on in my circumstances. But here's the truth. I need a promise for my situation. I need to know what God says about my life. I need, to, I need like a Genesis 50, 20 promise in my life that what the enemy meant for evil, God will turn it for good. I need that promise in my life. For some of us that are struggling to make ends meet, 
For some of us that are struggling to make it financially, I need like a Psalm 20 verse 7 promise in my life that some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Come on, somebody. I need a promise to help me through. My faith and hope are in him. My faith and hope is not in what's around me because if it is, I'll always be anxious. Far too many of us have an outcomes-based faith. Outcome-based faith says, I will serve him if. God is good if. I'm here to let you know God is good because Jesus showed us who God is. So Elijah, in this moment, chooses that soundtrack. Now, some of us are like, Harrison, I get it, but that's easier said than done. Like, I get, I get follow Jesus, but what about, like, what, what about when life just keeps going? Here's what happens next. Verse 41, again, Elijah said to Ahab, go eat and drink, for there is a sound of a heavy rain. Do we have the scripture? It's verse 41. So Ahab went off to eat and to drink, but Elijah climbed to the top of Mount Carmel. So, Elijah says, I hear the sound of rain, responding in faith. I'm going to listen to God's voice. <clears throat> so Ahab goes and drinks, and Elijah begins to climb the mountain. And I think that the reason Elijah's climbing the mountain is because he wants to go and get a new perspective. He's called for rain, but it's hot outside. So he thinks to himself, I'm just going to go a little bit higher. Because if I go higher, maybe I'll see a new perspective. Maybe if I get up there, I'll see a cloud. Maybe if I get up there, I'll know that God is faithful. Have you guys ever resolved to follow God, but then nothing changes? Come on, anyone in this place? You ever resolved to be faithful, but life just gets worse? Elijah climbs up, but nothing changes. This is how one commentator put it, describing it beautifully, the scene he would have, he would have saw as he looked out. It says, from his elevation, the old familiar scene of barrenness and desolation would have met his eye. Waterless channels at his feet, the noted vegetation of caramel turned into ashes. No living blade of grass to relieve the dull monotony for miles and miles. As far as his vision could extend, the earth was gasping at every pore. So he gets up, he chooses to respond in faith, but his situation looks the same. You ever been like, I'm going to faithfully come to church. That's how I'm going to change this thing around. Then your situation doesn't change. I'm going to faithfully follow Jesus now, but you lose your friends. I'm going to put my trust in God, but I lose my job. I'm going to faithfully give 10%. Now I just have 90% of my bank account. Come on, you ever been there? So Elijah gets up, but nothing changes. So when Elijah and what he sees doesn't change, he decides to change something else. It says, again, Elijah climbs to the top of Carmel. He bent down to the ground and he put his face between his knees. Now, what he's doing here is he's praying. He's praying. But what's interesting, if you read commentaries on this, most commentaries you read will let you know <clears throat> that what Elijah was doing in this moment, was, he was praying, but he was putting himself in a posture that was unfamiliar and unknown. In other words, he was doing something totally unique to him. And I began to wonder and I began to visualize what he was doing. And what I think he was doing in that moment is he was saying, hey, nothing around me is changing. Everything that I see in my peripheral is staying the same. So I need to adjust my frequency. I need to see not what's around me. I need to tap into something within me. 
And so here's number two. How do, I, how do I begin to see the rain in barren seasons? I have to adjust my frequency. And what that means is this. Once I make the resolution to say, I'm going to believe God, I'm going to follow what he says, then I have to put myself in a posture where now I can believe it. Because how many of you guys know that the feeling associated with faith is often fleeting? Meaning, I resolve to follow Jesus. I feel good on Sunday. I don't feel so good on Tuesday. You guys ever been there? I'm going to give my life to Jesus at summer camp three weeks later. But my friends are kind of the same. And so what Elijah does when he chooses to believe the word of God, but he doesn't see the difference, he begins to adjust his frequency. And I began to imagine what Elijah was doing. Now, it says that he got low. He bent down on his knees. Now, what I think Elijah was doing is I think he was literally putting his, leg, his head like between his legs. Now, I can't really do that because I'm not that flexible. But I, be, I began to imagine what I think Elijah was doing in that moment. And I sort of imagined him like this. He's sitting there. And he sees the situation. He sees that the weather isn't changing. So he says, I can't look at what's around me. I need to remember what's within me. And so he puts his head between his legs. And I sort of imagine him covering his eyes. And I remember him. And I imagine him remembering the word of God. He said, Elijah, the rain's coming. Whether you see it, whether you feel it, is coming. But Elijah has to get into a new posture that gives him the faith to not look at what's around him, but remember the God that lives within him. Does that make sense? And so I just think, for some of us today, the reason our faith is stalled is because we've never found the posture that allows us to cut off all the things around us that can hold us back from believing. And what I love about that posture that Elijah takes and the uniqueness of it is that sometimes we think faith is a one-size-fits-all. Some of us have heard, if you want to hear God's voice, get into a closet, turn off the lights, listen to the silence. And if that works for you, Amen does not work for me. So my frequency, when I feel like I'm overcome by fear, when I feel like I'm not doing a good job, when I feel like I'm failing, I need to get God's word in my spirit. And the way that I do that is not in silence. It's through music. And it's through music that I play really, really loud. And so sometimes I'll get into my car and I'll crank my Mazda 3 sound system to the utmost it can get to, which I wish it could get a little bit higher. If I'm, if I'm not in my car, I'll, I'll put my headphones in and I'll put my music as loud as I can and I'll find a song so filled with faith and I'll just keep listening to it until I believe it. I'll just keep listening to it until it's in my spirit, until I can feel like I'm just like David. I serve the God, come on somebody, who made a shepherd boy courageous. I serve a God, come on somebody, who did things in the past, but he still does things today. And so I need to get those songs in my spirit because when God calls me forward, when God calls me to take ground, when God says be a good husband, when God says be a good father, be a good leader, be a good pastor, move forward in faith, and I don't feel it. I don't want my feelings to lead. I want God's word to lead. So I need a song in my spirit. I need to hear the sound of an abundance of rain. I love David. Because David did something to adjust his frequency. Whenever he was overcome by fear, he didn't just pray. He wrote music. Look at Psalm, I think it's Psalm 42. Psalm 42, verse 5, if you can put it out on the screen. David says, why my soul are you downcast? He says, why are you so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will praise him, my Savior and my God. So when David was feeling down, you want to know what he did? He just spoke to his feelings. 
He just spoke to his soul, and he began to write music. He began to create. And I just felt like a, for, for a creator in this space today, maybe the frequency in which you are going to find peace, maybe the frequency in which God is going to adjust your soundtrack is when you create. You see, far too many of us have only used our creative potential to make money. You've used our creative potential as a means to an end. But what if God has put something inside of you that you can create in order to uplift your spirit? You can create in order to change your situation and your circumstance. Why, my soul, are you downcast? So you got to find your posture. My posture is loud music. Some of you guys, that sounds like hell on earth. you got to find your posture. Maybe some of us, your posture in this place is when you get in that place of depression, I need to delete some apps on my phone. I need to get rid of Instagram. I need to get rid of TikTok. I need to get rid of Facebook because these things are clouding and polluting what's in my mind. I know God's word says that I am who he says I am, that I'm a child, I'm loved, I'm chosen. I'm a holy person, a royal priesthood, but I just, I just keep seeing other people and their life looks better than mine. So for some of us, your posture is simply this. I gotta take my phone and I gotta chuck it. I gotta adjust my frequency. Come on, somebody. What's my posture? Elijah gets in his prayer posture, and he remembers the word of God. And when I get that in my spirit, then I have to respond in faith. And so what Elijah does next is he responds in faith. And it says he gets up in verse 44, or 43, and he says to his servant, 1 Kings 18, 43, he says, go and look towards the sea. He told his servant. Nothing's changed, but I got into my prayer posture, and I reminded myself what God says. So he tells his servant, go and look towards the sea. Go and look towards the sea. Have you guys ever been so full of faith? It's going to change. It's going to be different. His servant says, there's nothing. <laughs> but I was in my prayer posture. There's nothing. But I love this situation. Because Elijah says, go back. Second time. Go see. Come on, there's got to be a cloud this time. There's got to be some sign of life this time. Nothing. Elijah says, go back. Come on, this is the word of God to someone today. I've been looking at my situation. My kids don't look like they're changing. God says, go back. The job market doesn't seem to be hot. God says, go back. I don't feel any different when I come to church. God says, go back. Four times. There's still nothing, Elijah. Five times. There's still nothing, Elijah. Someone right now, you're on number six. I keep going back and there's nothing. But it says the seventh time. It says the seventh time. Verse 44. The servant went up and looked. Next, next one, next one. My iPad's so far back. And he said, a cloud as small as a hand is rising up from the sea. Now you guys have seen clouds. A hand is really, really small. <laughs> Come on, give me, like, give me something. Give me a storm. But sometimes God just gives us a hand, a cloud, the size of the hand rising up from the sea. I wonder today if in this place, in this moment, someone's beginning to see a, a cloud as small as a hand rising from the sea. Can I just tell you, maybe that person that you've been about to give up on, I've been praying for too long, I haven't seen anything. What if today the word of the Lord is, listen, there's a, there's a cloud, as small as the size of a hand, rising up from the sea. Come on, man, for the person who's been disappointed. God, you didn't come through. I prayed and you didn't come through. I don't know if I can ever trust you again. What if today... There's a cloud rising, small as a hand. 
Because here's the thing. The cloud is always a sign of the rain to come. And so it ends, last verse. Hit me with it because I don't got it. The seventh time, the cloud came. So Elijah said, go and tell Ahab, hitch up your chariots and go before the rain stops you. Meanwhile, I love this. It says, meanwhile, the sky grew black with clouds. The wind rose and a heavy rain started to fall. Come on, can I speak to someone today? I just feel like you are on the edge of a breakthrough, but the enemy wants you to give up. I feel like God has a plan for your life. God has a plan for your family. But that which God has sown, the enemy's trying to steal. And I just believe you may not see it right now, but there's a cloud rising up the size of a hand. And though it may be small now, it just takes a moment for God to do what only he can do. It just takes a moment for that which was broken to be restored. It just takes a moment for that which was lost to be found. It just takes a moment. Come on, somebody. I see a cloud. I hear the sound of an abundance of rain. Come on, let, let's stand to our feet all over this place because I want to put this in our spirit. I believe my assignment today is really simple. I'm just here to raise up our faith. I'm just here today to let you know don't give up. It's too soon. It's too early. There's a cloud the size of a hand rising up. So you know what it is. You know the thing that you've been giving up on. You know the dream. You know the hope. You know the person. You know the circumstance. Some of us in this place, we feel like it's me. I can never change God. I've done too much. I've been too through. In a moment, in just a moment, the rain can come. So what I want to do as we close, I want us to just receive. I want us to receive the promise of God. So all over this place, come on, open up your hands. We're going to sing this song. And we don't sing it. But I want us to put it in our spirit. And we're going to learn it in this moment. We're just saying, God, I receive it. Like a flood. I receive it. Who you say I am, I receive it. The promise is over my life, I receive it. Forgiveness, I receive it. Some of us in this room have been trying to forgive ourselves. Here's the good news. Scripture never says forgive yourselves. It just says accepts his forgiveness. You are forgiven. You are free. Come on, receive it like a flood in our spirit.